Hi, and welcome to section 5.2 uh, for Math 181. Uh, this is the first of three videos uh, for this section. So in this section, we're looking at, we're going to be looking at what's called the definite interval. So I know you guys have had a ton of information uh, given to you over these past, I don't know, maybe, uh, well, several weeks, quite a few, a couple months here. If you think back to maybe like week two or maybe three of uh, the semester, you remember the um, difference quotient. So if we wanted to figure out derivatives, if we wanted to figure out the slope of a line to a curve, we use that difference quotient, right? So we plugged in f of x plus h, f of a, or f of a, f of a plus h, divided by h, etc. Factor, cancel out the h. It was a long process, a lot of chance for errors. You know, and the initial thought is, oh my God, this semester is going to take me forever if I have to do all these. Then all of a sudden you were given the shortcuts, right? You were given the derivative of a polynomial. You were given power rule. You were given function rule. I mean, um... Uh, chain rule, product rule, quotient rule. Given all those little shortcuts, it sped everything up. Unfortunately, this section is the difference quotient section in terms of integral. So it's going to be the long process of how to figure out these integrals. But it, the good thing is, you know, the next few sections here, then we kind of learn all the shortcuts and the easy way to do these. So for now, I guess bear with it understand the process behind what an integral is really doing um, and then once you you know learn once you get these uh, sections after this it'll hopefully speed up the process for you so let's look at the following curve let's say we have a function then it comes down below so maybe almost like a sine or a cosine function, something like this. So in the first video and in the, um, and, uh, let's see, was it this? Yeah, so in section 5.1, we are taking all those rectangles underneath the curve, adding them up. That was giving us our, uh, the area under the curve. But let's look at this one here. Let's say we have endpoints A and B. <clears throat> and let's say I'm just going to again divide it into, well, let, let's say I'm not even dividing it equally. Let's say I pick this one here, so let's call this x1. And then I have another interval over here, x2, and then x3, and finally uh, b, we'll call that x4. That's the end of our interval, and we'll call a is 0, the start of our interval. So now, if I was to pick any point within these intervals, so let's say I'm going to pick this one here, let's call this x1 star. If I was to draw, if I take this up to where the curve hits and then draw the rectangle that fits in the area, I would get that guy. Same for x2, so maybe I choose x2 star to be here. So I go to where that hits the curve, take that whole rectangle for that interval. Between 2 and 3, maybe I pick it somewhere close to the middle, x3 star. So go down to where that curve hits, so that gives me this rectangle. And then x4, maybe I pick it close to the end, so x4 star. Go up to the curve, and now draw this rectangle in. So what do we get here? So we're getting a bunch of rectangles for these different intervals. Some were missing part of it, some were taking area that's way outside of the curve. Plus what do we have? Well this is on the positive side, this is on the negative side, the negative side, the positive side. So now we're getting a bunch of areas of rectangles that might have plus and minus values that if we add them all up together you know, are not going to give us just some straight positive value. So these specific areas, 
So let's call it x0 to x1, x1 to x2, x2 to x3, x3 to x4. These are what are known as partitions. So we're partitioning the entire interval a to b into these separate intervals. And again, they don't necessarily have to be the same length. So this idea of this partitioning of these intervals, picking some random sample point within the intervals, figuring out the curve value at that interval and timesing it by the width, this was developed by a mathematician last name Riemann. And he created what is known as the Riemann sum, which says the following. The Riemann sum of n different intervals, n different partitions, is the sum as i goes from 1 to n of f of xi star times delta xi. So it's similar to what we saw in video uh, in section 5.1 is that we're evaluating function, but now we're not necessarily having to pick an endpoint. We're picking some random point in the interval, but because these uh, widths of the intervals could vary, we have to multiply it by just that interval width because it's not going to be constant. Remember the last example with the runner at the end of uh, the 5.1 videos? All the intervals were a half. They were all the same. With the Riemann sum, they don't necessarily have to be. So this gives us, leads us to the definition of the definite integral. And it says the following, if f is a function defined on the interval a, b, it's a closed interval, the definite integral of f from A to B is the number and so we have the following notation so we kind of get this elongated S that's the integral symbol A goes on the bottom B goes on the top this A is considered our lower limit. The B is the upper limit. And again, this little elongated S is an integral sign. So it's the integral from A to B of the function so f of x dx, so the function with respect to the variable x. And this is just <clears throat> the limit. Uh, so the limit, it's the limit of the sum, i is 1 to n, of these Riemann values, f of xi star delta xi, but it's the limit as the max of delta xi goes to zero. So what does this mean? We essentially, so before, like in section 5.1, we had all these equal size intervals and we made them as small as possible. It's the same idea here. So the intervals don't necessarily have to be the same, but ideally our max interval that we choose goes to zero. So it basically as before, becomes like a straight line. It becomes so small that the error between the curve and the top of the rectangle is, is basically zero. 
So it's the integral is just the Riemann sum when this max interval distance goes to zero. It becomes as small as possible. So this So it's that value provided the limit exists. If it does not exist, we say F Oh, I'm sorry, provided it does exist. So if it does exist, so it's that number, provided the limit exists, and if the limit does exist, we say f is integrable on the closed interval a, b. So this leads us, the last part of this video, theorem 3 listed in the book, which says that if f is continuous, on the closed interval a, b, or if f has only a finite number of jump discontinuity I guess continuities then F is integrable on a, b, so that is the integral from a to b of f of x dx exists. So if we want to know, does a, a integral exist? Well, if it's continuous or has only a finite number of jump discontinuities within a specified closed interval, then yes, it's inter integrable uh, on that interval, A, B. So that's uh, video one, mainly the Riemann sum, uh, this notation. So get familiar with this. This is what we're going to be seeing the rest of the chapter here. Integral sign, upper lower limits, f of x dx. As I told you at the start of this video, it's going to be a lot of information, a lot of steps when we start working these problems. Bear with it for now. Just try to get through it. Try to stay awake if possible. And um, once we get on to the next sections, it'll be a lot easier on you. So come on back and we'll look at video two.